This is the Lucid Air, and it's a little bit like when Harry Styles left the band One Direction to go it alone, because the guy who set up Lucid actually used to work for Tesla as their chief engineer, but he thought, wait a minute, I think I can do a better job on my own. But has he? Well, to find out, I'm going to talk you around this car. I'm going to show you some things that are good about it and some things that are really quite annoying about it. I'm also going to launch it to see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour because Lucid makes some really bold claims for this car's performance. Is it quick? Ooh, that wasn't quite what I was expecting. We're going to find out because I'm Matt Watson and you're watching Car Wow and I inhale the fly. Lovely. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let me talk you around the exterior design of the Lucid Air. So it's quite a wide car, and that's exaggerated by the fact that you have these chrome strips that run the full width and this big light bar, which Lucid says is the biggest unbroken light bar on any car, though I can see that there are actual brakes in the light itself. Are they lying? Anyway, what I can't criticize them for is the way that they've actually integrated the little spoiler into the boot lid. Looks cool. Moving to the side, the alloy wheel sizes start at 19 inches, which will be too small. These are the 21s. You can get two-tone paint like this car has, or you can just have it all one color if you prefer. You probably notice it's a very smooth aerodynamic shape. In fact, this is the most aerodynamic road car available. It's got a drag coefficient of 0.19 CD. The next most aerodynamic car you can get is the Mercedes EQS. That has a drag coefficient of 0.2 CD. So this is more aerodynamic and looks so much better than that Mercedes. So they have no excuse for making their car look so ugly when Lucid has made theirs look great, even though it's more aerodynamic. Now the aero is helped by features such as this. Look, these air breathers, which smooth the airflow down the side of the car. Plus, you have some more vents just under there, which feed air over the bonnet. Then there's the fact that this grill remains closed unless the batteries need cooling, then it opens up. And I really like the way that they've integrated the driving assistance sensors into the bodywork. They're not too obtrusive. I also like the light design and this big chrome strip on the front of the car. Looks really, really posh though when it's really sunny, it can burn out your retinas if you look in the wrong place and it reflects the sun into your eyes. Now, my eyes really did water when I saw the price of this car. So the entry-level air in Europe starts from over £150,000. This performance model costs over £190,000. So if you're thinking about changing your car, you probably need to sell your current car and you can do it through CarWow. All you have to do is upload some photos, give a brief description, then dealers all across the country will bid on your car. You then just pick the highest offer and they'll come to your house, take the car away, put the money into your account. It's dead easy. Now, if you want to do that now, click on the pop out banner up there or follow the link in the description below. Alternatively, you can do it at a later date by simply Googling help me car wow and we will help you sell your car. The Lucid Air is quite a bit more expensive than a Tesla Model S, but it feels a lot more expensive here on the inside. The materials used on the dash, such as this Alcantara suede stuff, this panelling here. Is that open pore ward or is it plastic? I don't know, but it feels nice. And then this material here, which once again, it all feels very lovely and solid. Apart from one thing that I've noticed, the steering wheel seems to creak and the seat a bit, which is a shame <laughs> because the steering wheel does feel nice and I like the design of it. The only thing I'm not sure about are these buttons, which are a bit plasticky. The ones on this side control your driver assistance systems like your cruise control. The one on this side is for your stereo. And that brings me on to the infotainment system. I love the design of this screen. It's a bit like that on a Porsche Taycan, but even better. So this screen here is your infotainment system. It has your music, it has your navigation, all that kind of stuff. This screen here is your digital driver's display with all your driving information. Then there's another screen here with touch sensitive buttons for things like your windscreen wipers and your lights and all that kind of stuff. Things that on a Tesla are buried into the main infotainment screen with the car's controls, which is what this screen does here. So like the Tesla, 
they have still got some functions operated only through this screen, such as if you want to move the steering wheel, you have to do it through this. I prefer to have an actual knob on the steering wheel. And if you wanted the door mirrors, you have to use this. And it's not the most sensitive, actually, this touch screen. You can also control things like the fan speed and all the stuff for your heated and cooled seats through here. But thankfully, you do have some shortcut buttons here as well. So you can do fan speed quickly using this and the temperature quickly using that. And there's your volume control for the stereo if you need to suddenly turn it down. In terms of storage, so underneath here, we have plenty of storage, a decent sized cubby there while it's charging for your mobile phone and it will just about fit my chunky Samsung Fold. You have two cup holders here, so they're only big enough for smaller bottles. Bigger bottles won't quite fit, but the door bins are really, really large. Underneath here, there is some more storage. Hmm. And if you look in there, there's USB ports. There is some more storage just behind here, but yeah, I'll reveal how you get to that a bit later in the video. Then we come to the glove box. So to get to the glove box, I need to press this button and then press that button on the screen to open a glove box, which is of decent size. <laughs> Then I want to show you this. One of the big things about this car is the glass roof. I love it. But they've mounted these sun visors onto it, which you're going to need if the sun's low. However, if it's not low, it'd be good to just be able to somehow detach them so you can just enjoy this full, big, extending windscreen, which is a bit like sitting in a fighter jet, though not so much with that there. Ah. Though, let me just show you the vanity mirror while I've got it down. So this cover is a bit like the covers you get for your iPad off eBay. Look, and it's hard to, uh, that's it, open it up to get to the mirror, which is actually a decent size and it's nicely lit as well. It does feel pretty special and unique in here. Anyway, let's check out the back seats. This car has three meters between the front and rear wheels. As a result, there is loads of room here in the back seats. Look how much leg room I've got absolutely tons of it. Headroom is actually all right as well, considering you've got this sloping roof line, which is just glass. It's nice, that is. Also, the seat bases are really, really deep, but there is one issue. That's the fact that there's not much distance between the actual floor and the top of the seats there, so you do feel like you're a little bit squatting. However, there's so much foot room that you can just stretch out like that. I think there is more room in the back of this than the Mercedes EQS. Also, if you have the slightly smaller battery model, then you don't have so many battery cells underneath the floor, which means you have more recessed footwell, which will make it a bit more comfortable. Though I can't really fault the comfort in this. Unless you're carrying three people in the back at once, you think it's gonna be fine because you've got this big soft middle seat. So when you're on your own, it's like, yeah, it's fine. But then if you get two people either side of you, you realize shoulder room is a bit tighter than you imagine. Also, the people on the two outer seats, they end up with their heads against this roof line because it just curves in so much. If you need to carry three people in the back of your electric car quite often, you're better off with a BMW iX. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, just click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below. But other than that though, this is a really nice car to travel in the back of, even if you're a baby. And fitting a baby seat is very easy. The doors open quite wide. The only issue is, is that the car's quite low, so you do have to stoop down to get the baby seat in. But once you've got it into position, there's loads of room to maneuver it. And even though the eyes fixed anchor points aren't behind some covers, they're easy to get to, to lock the seat in place. And there's just so much room back here that even with the bulky rear facing child seat, you can slide the front passenger seat quite a way back. Other things to note that if you are carrying a baby, you might like this carrying a baby in the car, not like in you. This is not gonna make any difference if it's... So you've got built-in sun blinds there into the windows. Will the windows go all the way down though? Come on. No, no dear. Not gonna fault this though. The door bins are pretty big back here. And you've got some posh airplane style pockets on the seat backs. There's some storage underneath here. And if I shut that, you have a couple of USB-Cs. Then you have your climate control here for the back seats. Plus, 
you have heating elements in each of these three seats, which I think is kind of cool. I'm sorry, or should that be kind of hot? No, that just sounds weird now. Anyhow, underneath here, you have some more storage, a couple of cup holders, and some through loading as well. And I think that's pretty much the back seats done and dealt with. Well, apart from this, these grub handles. They're so sturdy, they're like some kind of horse's bridle wear. Is that right? Do horses get married? You know what I mean. Now let's check out the luggage capacity, starting with the fruit, the front boot. So the capacity, according to Lucid, is 283 litres, which is slightly more than a Hyundai i10's normal boot and slightly less than a Vauxhall Corsa E's boot. But somewhere similar to both. Anyhow, doesn't look like 283 litres. That's because there's this false floor. And then clearly, lots of room. Oh, I can't help myself. I've got to get in it. But yes, look, lots of room. I'm sitting comfortably. This is a very big fruit. Let's check out the back boot. The boot. So here we have 627 litres of space. Though before you get too excited, the boot capacity the boot capacity on a Tesla Model S is 709 litres. So there is a bit of a lip to lift things over. Oop, yeah, there we go. But other than that, it's quite a useful square shape. Although once again, that doesn't look like 627 litres. That's because there's storage under here and storage under here and a 12 volt socket and some storage in this area here. Plus, if you need to carry longer items, you can lower the rear seats and they fold down to give you a lot more space. But there is one slight problem I found with this. The load height seems quite low, so you're really having to, like, look, watch, bend down to put stuff in. And then, because of how this isn't open too high, you often just twat your head like that and it hurts. And that brings on to five annoying things about the lucid air. The white stitching on the dash reflects so badly in the windscreen. It's very distracting. The indicator stalks are just a little bit too far from the steering wheel rims. Here we have to reach to get them. Plus the actual button for the windscreen washer is on the end of it. And what happens is you sometimes go to turn the indicator on and then you just you end up washing your windscreen at the same time. The view out the back window is terrible because the headrests for the back seats just obscure your view. There are only two levels of regen braking. Standard, which is very strong, and high, which is very, very, very strong. What there needs to be is two other settings. A low regen mode, which basically feels like normal engine braking in an internal combustion engine car, or off, so the car just coasts when you lift off the accelerator. Another thing that's a problem is that while you do have different driving modes, smooth, swift, and sprint, there's not an individual mode where you can mix and match your favorite settings. The rear cameras are located quite low down and they get very dirty very easily. So you'd have thought that a high-tech company like Lucid would have had little washers for them to keep them clean. But no, you actually have to get out and clean them off yourself with your fingers. However, it's not all bad. That actually brings you on to five good things about the Lucid Air. The Lucid Air has 23 cameras in total. So up here, you've got your forward-facing camera, your reversing camera, and you can zoom in and out on those if you want to. Then down here, you have your surround view cameras and you can just look around the car like that. It's like a video game. And it even follows you as you drive along. Look, Whee! And then you have blind spot cameras. So when you indicate, you get a feed from just by the door mirror on each side of the car, just like on a Kia EV6. Now, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below. You know, if you want a more affordable, yet still high-tech EV. This car has a very distinctive horn. Have a listen to this. Two-tone. Like the bodywork. You can move the screen up and out the way. Look. To give you access to this cubby space. That is the coolest cubby lid I've ever seen. Wait a minute, what's in here? 
What are those? Who's they? Weird. There's a few things I like about the doors. So the door handles themselves, the way they pop out is really cool and they work exactly as you want them to. Then there's the fact that you have soft close so you don't need to slam the doors to pull them to and then it will close the rest of the way itself. You also have double glazing on the windows for better sound insulation. Then here on the inside you have a release switch for the door so you don't have to pull, you just gently flex your finger and it opens the door. Obviously that's electrically operated. What normally happens in cars is that you need to have a separate manual release in case the battery goes flat. However, Lucid has actually integrated the manual release into the switch itself. You just have to pull it a bit harder. Oh, I like a manual release. As with the Tesla, you can remove the aero wheel covers for a slightly different look. It is a bit of a faff to do. Thankfully, I've got staff who can do it for me. So, away you go. I think I prefer it the way it was. Can you put them back? Before I drive the car, let's talk about batteries, motors and charging. And first things first, I quite like the way this charging port opens. Yeah, satisfying. So this car can charge at up to 300 kilowatts on a DC fast charger. In terms of batteries and motor combinations, there's five different choices in Europe and six in America. I can't remember all the choices, but all cars have dual motors. But here's the power output and the battery capacities for those cars. Now this particular car is the Air Dream Edition Performance. So right now, it's the most powerful Lucid Air you can get. It puts out 1,111 horsepower and 1,390 newton meters of torque. There will be a tri-motor version, a Sapphire along in the future, but for now, this is where the performance is at. So I'm going to launch it and see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour. But before I do that, let's take it for a more sensible drive. What will the range be like? Will it be able to achieve its claimed range? Let's find out. OK, let's see what this Lucid Air is like to drive, starting off within town. So I've got the car in the smooth setting. So it means that the throttle response isn't quite so aggressive. The steering is as light as it can be and the suspension is slackened off to as soft as it can be. However, it's still a bit on the firm side. I'm not sure those huge alloy wheels are helping particularly either. You do feel the bumps a bit. It's not terrible, but if you're driving over uneven surfaces, the car does seem a little bit fidgety. However, the faster you go, it seems to just iron out the bumps a bit better. Maybe that's the moral of the story. Go faster. The steering though is light, which is good. Visibility forward is really good as well. Decent sized door mirrors. I've already mentioned the view at the back window. <laughs> Anyhow, let's check out the turning circle because this is a long car. Can I make it round here? And I'm gonna press this button down here to get my cameras up so I can see if I'm gonna make it round. Don't curb the alloy wheels. Can I make it past this car? Will I? These lines are really helpful. Eh, it's saying stop, I'm ignoring. The turning circle is actually 11.8 meters, which is better than a Tesla Model S Plaid. It's really quite good considering that this car doesn't have rear wheel steering. Ha <laughs> ha, that was really good. Just wait for this van to go Then this car. Anyone else? Yes, then this other car. And off we go. Now the brakes on the car, in town. Do you know what? There is so much regen braking, even if I just, let's turn that off, put it into, oh, I have to press this button down there. Oh, it's already in standard mode. That felt so aggressive. Look, I'm lifting off. It's bringing the car to a complete standstill. Uh, oh no, I've got it on roll. So um, put it into park, hold. Now it'll hold. Drive again. Bear with me. Drive again. Enter pin to drive. What? It's asking me to enter. <laughs> What? Why is, it, why is it asking for a pin? I've just been driving! What's... Uh, what? It wants a pin! Just stop with the pin. Just let me drive. Key fob not detected. Here's the key fob. Finally detected it. Now I can drive again. Ever wish you hadn't stopped to do a demonstration? 
Right, here we go again. No, drive. This is getting embarrassing. Here we go. Right, now I'm going to go into high regen mode. Yeah, it's a little bit more aggressive. You can really one pedal drive this thing around town. You don't need to touch the brakes at all. Then you give them a stab though, just to feel them. Yeah, they feel quite good and quite natural. Though if you just tickle them a bit, they don't do anything, it's all regen. Am I confusing you? I'm confusing me. Let's see what it's like when you go on faster roads. <laughs> okay, first thing I'm gonna do is put the car into sprint mode. I'm gonna confirm that, because I'm brave. Because I wanna show you the acceleration when you're joining a faster road, such as a motorway or dual carriageway. So here I am cruising along at 40. Let's see how quick it takes to get up to 70. I'm gonna floor it. I mean, like, uh, I had to back off because uh, it, it went so quickly, so quickly. <laughs> that makes sense. Right, I'm gonna do it again, 40. Here we go. I mean, <sighs> wow, that is insane. Almost dangerously quick, that. Anyway, cruising along at 70, which takes you no time to get to. Hardly any road noise at all. Sound insulation is really good. Apart from one thing, I'm getting some wind buffeting from this pillar here. It's not bad, I'm not having to raise my voice. You know, I'll be able to make telephone conversations fine, but it's because the rest of the car is so silent, my ears are just picking up that. I don't think it's bad at all. What is a bit bad though is the, the range. So, this car is supposed to do over 550 miles on a full charge, but according to this long-term trip computer, this particular car is averaging three miles per kilowatt hour. And when you multiply that up by the car's battery capacity of 118 kilowatt hours, this thing is actually getting a real world range of 354 miles. Now I'm sure if I nursed it and maybe went a bit slower, we could get a better energy consumption figure. But in order to do the claim figure, it needs to average 4.7 miles per kilowatt hour. And I just don't think you're gonna get that. I really don't. Anyway, let's forget about efficiency for a moment and see what this car is like to drive on a twisty country road. So I'm keeping it in sprint mode. And oh my gosh, I mean, it can't off rock it out the bends. So here's the corner, you come out of it, floor it, and it's just insanely quick. Such an utterly mental machine. Oof, got into the ABS brake in there. <laughs> Accelerating so hard. Then, whoa, wait, there we go. Actually, when you give them a good old prod, the brakes seem very strong, better than in a Tesla Model S. Okay, let's throw it through some more bends. That's how it copes. Stays very flat. The steering feels a bit disconnected from the road though. Yeah, I mean, it's got plenty of grip and considering how heavy it is, it does a good job of going around corners. Is it fun? Not really. You know, it's capable. Whee! I don't think it blends sportiness and comfort as well as a Mercedes AMG EQS 53. I think that just does a better job in terms of its handling and its suspension comfort. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below. Now let's find out if this is actually quicker at accelerating than that Mercedes. Let's launch it. Lucid says this car will do 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds, though they time it with one foot rollout because they're American and they like to cheat. Same with Tesla, they do one foot rollout and they claimed two seconds for their plaid. But this is how quick I actually did in that car. What did we get there? 2.4 seconds. And that was without one foot rollout. And I measure without one foot rollout. So let's see how quick this Lucid is without one foot rollout. Specialist timing gear will reveal all. Let's do this. Three point zero two seconds. So it didn't beat the three second mark. Let's give it one more go. There's traction issues then. Okay, here we go again. That was worse. Go me. One more go. This is your last chance, Lucid. What can you do? Yes! Yes, we did it. Sub three seconds, 2.95 to 60. 
without one foot rollout. So then what's my final verdict on the Lucid Air? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the Lucid Air. It really is a nice and extremely rapid electric car. It's just not quite luxurious enough for its very high price. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know if you agree with my verdict in the comments below. Click on those windows there for some more videos. And if you click on that box there, you can go to CarWow to sell your car the easy way. Thanks for watching.